Signori, buongiorno, benvenuti a tutti. Direi di cominciare in orario perché questo è un, insomma, un dovere che abbiamo nei confronti dei nostri ospiti ma anche nei confronti vostri perché siete venuti così numerosi e la cosa mi fa molto piacere che vi voglio trattenere il più possibile senza far calare la vostra attenzione. Allora, due parole soltanto, eh, intanto di ringraziamento, ringraziamento perché vedo qui molti giovani dei nostri licei e noi dall'inizio dell'anno abbiamo cominciato una bella collaborazione con questi giovani perché abbiamo organizzato un convegno su etica e estetica del paesaggio insieme, voi eh, in maniera veramente molto professionale avete fatto un sito che eh, fa estetica, che veramente è un sito molto frequentato, molto bello, che, di cui eh, mi complimento e eh, è continuato dopo anche il convegno una serie di incontri, di incontri anche di, di notevole livello nelle vostre scuole e questo eh, incontro di oggi voleva essere un po' il coronamento di questo lavoro eh, di sensibilizzazione al paesaggio che avevamo iniziato eh, all'inizio dell'anno e nello stesso tempo volevamo anche eh, fare un omaggio a Pistoia Capitale della Cultura perché questi sono i temi che saranno al centro mh, non soltanto necessariamente dell'interesse delle amministrazioni non soltanto di Pistoia ma di tutta Italia ma saranno i temi al centro della eh, nostra università di Uniser che è in una fase di eh, lenta, purtroppo mh, troppo lenta trasformazione ma che eh, diventerà un piccolo centro di eccellenza che si occupa di paesaggio, di rischio, di salute che sono i temi che sono al centro della eh, giornata che noi eh, vi offriamo. E, mh, meglio di questo eh, inizio non ci poteva essere, siamo grati a Major Carter, a Conayan Dyke, a Biurgi, a Malgrave, a Costanza e tu, tu ora me ne sono dimenticato uno ed è, ed è, ed è una colpa, a professor Embrex che eh, sono stati eh, colpiti e affondati perché noi non abbiamo invitato nessun altro, le prime persone che ci sono venute in mente perché erano le autorità eh, di assoluta eccellenza per le cose di cui volevamo eh, parlare in questa sede hanno detto subito di sì e questo è qualcosa che probabilmente deve essere di, di, di vanto anche per Pistoia perché non sempre nella provincia eh, ci sono persone che sono disposte a fare viaggi dall'Australia, dal Canada, dall'America per, eh, per venire eh, per venire in un posto così lontano ci diceva ieri Major Carter dice noi siamo qui e eh, qualcuno ci dice ah bellissimo siete andati a Pistoia bellissimo altri ah, dicono Pistoia ma che cos'è non sanno e ovviamente quando si parla di Firenze si parla di Roma si parla di queste città c'è un appeal completamente diverso bello vedere che anche Pistoia comincia ad avere questa attrattiva alla quale eh, noi speriamo che il nostro centro, che sarà un centro di ricerca più ancora che di formazione, ma la formazione ci sarà eh, assolutamente, anche se sarà una formazione per lo più post laurea, ma insomma vedremo, tutto sarà da decidere e probabilmente da decidere insieme, perché Pistoia si sta avventurando in una dimensione che eh, è molto diversa da quella, da quella eh, praticata finora e quindi io ringrazio di nuovo gli eccellenti ospiti di questo convegno ringrazio Gabriele Paolinelli del laboratorio di paesaggistica che già si è insediato nella nostra università ringrazio Francesco Ferrini che è un nostro collaboratore da sempre qui a Uniser c'è stato a lungo un, un, un corso di laurea triennale in paesaggisti in scienze di balistiche ma non è detto che non ritornino anche dei corsi eh, o triennali o magistrali perché insomma, Ferrini è di casa, è un pistoiese acquisito. Ringrazio Marcello Galeotti perché eh, anche lui si sta de dedicando a Pistoia, soprattutto come ex presidente del CISA per eh, un 
problema e per temi che sono di assoluta attualità, che sono quelli del rischio, eh, insieme stiamo anche pensando un po' ambiziosamente, forse troppo ambiziosamente, lo vedremo, di eh, mettere a Pistoia un, uh, un corso di laurea interateneo sul rischio ambientale e sanitario e speriamo di eh, riuscire. Ci sarà anche in lingua inglese e questo spiega perché c'è questa attenzione anche da fuori d'Italia, perché eh, è importante tenere vivi i rapporti con eh, i posti un po' più fortunati del, della nostra Italia, dove la ricerca si fa davvero, dove ci sono i centri di ricerca in questi giorni. Qualcuno mi ha toccato anche proprio dei nostri amministratori spiegati che cos'è un centro di ricerca, perché quando è venuto in visita l'Entuet, che è un professore che ci ha portato a Pistoia questo parco di piante officinali, ora ospitato da Cespevi, e che eh, ha un centro per la, conservazione delle, per la preservazione delle tradizioni mediche al, a Huntington, nei, a San Marino, vicino a Los Angeles, diceva ma quella è un'università, no, non è un'università, è un centro di ricerca, come Smithsonian a Washington, sono centri di ricerca, ma non per questo, eh, anche se non ci sono studenti nel senso tradizionale delle nostre università, sono popolatissimi e hanno... Il, eh, eh, e sono mh, quei centri che, che trascinano, che trainano la, la, la ricerca e l'innovazione negli Stati Uniti come nei, nei, in altri posti eh, al mondo e quindi eh, ci dovremo abituare anche a questo perché eh, questa abitudine, ora lo sentiremo anche dalla eh, lettura che farà Major Carter eh, è un qualcosa che invita voi invita voi eh, studenti a cercare di vedere nel futuro, di intravedere delle prospettive che fino ad oggi una scuola un po' eh, inamidata, eh, priva di, di un, eh, elasticità nell'innovazione, soprattutto l'innovazione nel senso di una, eh, eh, del fatto che le discipline non sono più oggi praticabili come si praticavano prima. Noi siamo già eh, endemicamente eh, legati a questa divisione fra materie scientifiche e materie umanistiche che già oggi eh, lo vediamo dappertutto come un grosso danno fatto all'unità della cultura occidentale e in più l'università carica anche di ulteriori eh, specializzazioni, muri, eh, i famosi settori scientifico disciplinari che non si possono valicare nella ricerca eh, se, se non a costo di non sapere poi come fare una carriera universitaria, una carriera di ricerca eccetera. Ebbene, credo che delle, degli esempi, dei momenti di riflessione comune eh, alla, al, ai quali ho piacere che partecipi proprio la base studentesca eh, su come riorganizzare anche le nostre università e la nostra, le nostre prospettive di, eh, culturali in Italia sia qualcosa di molto importante e anche se qui a Pistoia si costituirà un, una piccola riserva indiana eh, credo che un giorno ne avremo anche tutti i meriti e tutti i riconoscimenti del caso perché la direzione nel resto del mondo è quella che intendiamo intraprendere noi. Quindi io vi auguro un buon ascolto per questo convegno e do subito intanto la, come c'è invito Francesco Ferrini a essere qui accanto a Majora Carter e e buon, e buon ascolto. Ringrazio collega Alessandro Pagnini per l'introduzione. Ti aggiungo solo che se guardate un po', avete visto su internet i profili dei sei relatori di oggi, vi renderete conto che non so, abbiamo fatto bingo, abbiamo fatto qualcosa che eh, io penso in altre parti del mondo. Eh, si chiedono ancora come abbiamo fatto a prendere queste sei, a mettere queste sei persone che dai loro profili si evince anche parleranno di una cosa comune ma da sei punti di vista eh, diversi sono sei prominent scientists cioè persone che sono dei, 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 
opinion leader nel loro, nel loro settore. Iniziamo con uh, Major La Carte, io ho avuto la fortuna di incontrarla 6-7 anni fa uh, più o meno uh, a Firenze perché fu conferito un premio che era il monitor, il monitor Giardino che è della Fondazione Cassa Risparmio di Firenze che è sorella della Fondazione uh, di, uh, di Pistoia. Major La Carte è un avvocato, uh, quindi direte che c'entra un avvocato nella, nel settore della, della pianificazione del verde, della, della, delle smart city, eccetera. Cioè, in realtà eh, lei si è sempre occupata di eh, valorizzare i talenti e ha realizzato un grandissimo progetto che è stato il recupero di certe aree del Bronx, chiaramente con architetti del paesaggio, con agricoltori, con persone che con lei collaboravano, tutti giovani motivati, persone spesso tolte alla strada e trasformate anche in business in businessman. Quindi eh, vedete che è molto entusiasta, trasmette molta energia. Eh, capirete anche perché eh, la abbiamo invitata. So I leave you the podium for your uh, presentation and thanks for uh, being here and thanks for your uh, effort to be here. Also. Grazie. I don't know what he said, but I do love hearing my name in Italian, so thank you. Just talk to me that way, that's fine. Um, but I am really happy to be here. Um, yeah, we are. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, and so I'm sorry, I'm, I do feel a little nervous uh, speaking in front of you. Okay. Um, And I am a New Yorker, a native New Yorker, so I speak very quickly. So I'm going to try to slow it down so that I won't uh, make the interpreter mad at me. Uh, but my today I want to talk to you about the work that I do, the approach that I do. And the title of my talk is Community as Corporation. And it's all about how do we retain and keep the talent that is in all communities. I don't care how bad a community may seem, there's always great things in it, primarily the people that are in it. But we don't always think that we need to keep the talent that's in our communities. But if we thought of communities as corporations, as companies, you know, think about it. If you're a Google or a Microsoft, or um, even if you just have a, a beautiful letter making shop somewhere, You train your talent, you, you invest resources in them so that they can be the best uh, employee and part of the workforce that you have. You don't want that, that person to take that, all those resources that you put in them, and then leave and go someplace else. But in low status communities, or sometimes just called poor communities, places where there's lots of, of, of poverty, places where um, folks grow up thinking that there's, if you need to you're, stay in one of those communities, that you end up, um, you have to measure success by how far you get away from them. You know, they're the places that, you know, don't have great shops, that are, you know, the people are poor, that there's lower educational uh, um, attainment for people that live in those areas. Uh, sometimes they're, you see it in their, in their health, that they're generally, they have other health conditions. Um, more so than you see in higher status or more higher income communities. And again, those are places that people are taught to measure success. If they come from those neighborhoods, we're taught to measure success by how far we get away from them. And uh, so our work here, or the work that we've been working on, the approach that we're doing, is, uh, is all about how do we retain the talent that's there. And so I'm from a place in, in New York City called the South Bronx. Uh, the South Bronx is the birthplace of hip hop or rap music. Uh, it's the birthplace of salsa music. It's a really culturally very rich part of the world. Uh, but it's also known as a place that is kind of the, 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 the epitome or big example of urban blight. Uh, when I was growing up in the 1970s, um, oh, this is really interesting because I learned this word. Uh, or this phrase last night from Alessandro, um, donare a casa, uh, which in, um, is a sort of loose translation for what we call homecoming. 
um, people wanting to come back home to a place, so whether you're away at war or you go to college or whatever, you want to come back home because that home that you have is a value. You see the value in it, you want to stay there, you want to invest in it, you want people to know that you're from that kind of place. In the place that I grew up in, there wasn't any of this. We, we were actually the bright, hard-working kids that grew up in those neighborhoods, in my neighborhood, we were taught, leave if you want to be somebody, you want to be somebody special, you want to grow up, get an education, just get out of here. And because this is the kind of stuff that I grew up with. In the 1960s, late 60s, going into the 1980s, it was a lot of financial disinvestment in our communities, and in, the, in communities in, in like the South Bronx, all over the country. Um, so there was no way to get loans or, um, or money to invest, to, re to reinvest in your own buildings. And so landlords, people who owned those buildings, were actually torching them, were literally committing arson, setting them on fire so that they could collect insurance money rather than try to make, rather than try to get money uh, to, to make their buildings better. So burning these buildings created this kind of um, environment for us to grow up in. And you know, again, kids like me were taught, this is not the place for you. You're going to grow up, get an education, and leave. Um, but after many of those buildings burned, we lost about 60% of the population in the South Bronx when I was when I was young. Um, all those buildings, many in the, both the industrial and also the residential area, this was what took its place. These type of environmental um, burdensome burdens uh, within the within the community. So we can with our community handle a lot of the city's waste infrastructure, a lot of its uh, power uh, production infrastructure, a lot of its sewage infrastructure, and this was all in a very, very small, uh, one, one square mile within all of New York City. And a lot of that, all of that um, was actually handled in, in my the community that I was born and raised in. And so of course, this was the kind of place that we were taught to leave. And so by the time I was at probably the age of many of the young people that I hear now going off to college, or I was just, I was, knew I would never return, to, except to visit my mother who was a very good cook. But other than that, I had no interest in coming back um, because I you know, had a great education, uh, I was away at college, I didn't want to come back, and I only came back because I was broke when I was going into graduate school and I needed a very cheap place to stay, which happened to be my parents' house, unfortunately, and my mother was a good cook, so that was great. But it was around that same time, you know, I felt ashamed to have to go to New York University and then come back home to this, to this area because it was an embarrassment. It did, it felt like a, like, um, a stain you know, on me that people could see, knowing that I was from a place like this. And, um, but even though the buildings had been fixed up, but there was still nothing that kept me there. Um, it wasn't a great place to live. And I only started staying because the city was planning on building even more waste facilities on our waterfront. And, and that's because I did have a little bit of education, or a lot of education at that point, um, and, but I also got to see the world a little bit, and I realized that our community had been treated that way, but we were considered the place where you dump all the things that wealthier and usually whiter communities in, in, um, in our cities could afford to avoid. Uh, so we got the waste, we got the power infrastructure, we got all the bad things that nobody else wanted. And, and then, but I realized that I could either pretend that I don't see that and just move on with my life, or I could be a part of the change that I wanted to see happen. And so I chose the latter um, after a bit of, of soul searching. And, uh, and, and it, I got this really interesting note, or rather um, a, a, a request to write a proposal from the U.S. Forest Service to work on some of the, one of the threatened rivers uh, in, in urban areas called the Bronx River. And I took, I did a proposal and was literally able to take a tiny little small seed grant um, of only $10,000, which is not much, you know, considering it was supposed to last about 18 months. Um, and we were able to leverage it into transforming this dump 
that, that actually dead-ended at the Bronx River, because there was supposed to be a bridge that was going to go over it, but it never happened, which meant that that little site was going to become, could, could have become something like a, uh, like a park. And so we used that money, and this was just sort of like the early version of it, where we changed it just a bit to just clean it up a lot. And then this is what the site looks like right now. But it took many years to get to that point, actually seven years exactly, to get to that point. Because first of all, it was a lot of community cleanups, um, and then we were able to just get it to a point where other folks decided, where our city and state decided to invest more than three million American dollars in developing it to make it look like this. Um, so this was back in 2006, right after it was first uh, done. And it's become this really incredible space that the community has grown to love. Um, they loved it the first day it was built, actually. But the thing is, people didn't realize that there were these beautiful parks in the community. Once they realized it, was, they looked at the community in a different way. They were like, oh, we would have to leave our neighborhood in order to have anything nice you know, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our space for our kids to play in. And then they realized that, no, that at least in this way, they could actually have something beautiful to be in. And I got married in the park back in uh, 2006 as well. Um, and so it was a really beautiful place to have a wedding, but what it more importantly did was actually show that there was some value in our community. Because most people before this park was built didn't even know that we had a, a waterfront. They didn't know that we had this river that could be this beautiful resource for them. They, they weren't taught to believe that we had any value. And then suddenly, or not suddenly, it took seven years to get it to this point, there was this beautiful park that they loved. But there were still all these other things within the community that we, that actually continued to, to and make people believe that the community didn't really have a lot of value, that there wasn't, that it wasn't worth staying in for very long. Like these are the types, you know, you you're guys are Ita Italian, and there's like amazing food, like every four steps. In places like we live, it's really not. In poor neighborhoods in particular, these are not the kind of, they're not healthy, they're not, many of them are actually are totally bad for you. Um, and we don't have a lot of variety in terms of what we have. Lots of fast food. Um, we don't have the kind of uh, local economic developments that make you want to spend your money there. If you can leave, and it's not like many of these, these, like these small businesses are very cheap either. Sometimes they're a lot more expensive than what you find you know, in better parts of the city. Um, and there's also lots of discount stores like these, which again, uh, I like a bargain as much as anybody else, but after a while, it, it gets a little old and stale. Um, and we have plenty of places if you want to self-medicate yourself, uh, lots and lots of liquor stores, or you can say pharmacies as well. Uh, because there are a lot of health problems in, in our communities too. So whether you're getting self-medicated or medicated by a, a doctor, there's stuff for you there. Um, and there's all, but there, interestingly enough, there also even if you do want to save money and, and build up your financial, um, uh, your own financial development by saving money or investing or anything like that, you can't really do it in our communities because we have these things called, uh, there's um, check cashing stores, so you go and you pay a fee and you get your check cash. Or you can, you know, a, a pawn shop where you uh, uh, have a, something and then you basically loan it to somebody who may or may not sell it for you, but they charge a fee for that. So it's not, these are all sort of taxes, I think, on being poor, and they're not real financial institutions like banks or, or credit unions that actually help you save money and build up your own financial profile. We don't have anything like that in, in our own communities. There literally are no banks, <coughs> no banks. Um, and last, but definitely not least, we have lots of, of, of social housing, or public housing, as it's called um, in, a, in, in our community, where they're, they are, it's, it's subsidized by the government. Um, so the government pays uh, the landlords who own it um, lots of money in order to house poor people. And, but what, and so before anybody says that you know, Majora Carter doesn't like poor people or poor communities, that's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that all those things I told you about before, when you add them all up, what it does is concentrate poverty and all of the things associated with it. 
from poor health outcomes to bad educational outcomes to um, you know, higher crime rates to people feeling that there is no hope if they stay in their own communities. You add all that up, you develop a sense of social isolation and I think even contempt for yourself and the people around you because you're not led to believe that there's anything of value in those communities. And I've seen that same kind of, um, of, uh, you know, of community, and it's not just in, in inner city or you know, black and Latino communities in the States. I've seen it in poor white communities. I've seen it in Native American communities. It's all the same. It's all about how do we concentrate poverty? Are we keeping the, or are we actually telling the smart, you know, bright, hardworking kids from those communities to see value in their community so they can come back and invest, or are we telling them to leave and take all of their talent with them? Their, the fact that they will be making money, that they'll be doing great at some point in their lives. You know, when I do presentations like this, um, you know, in my, in my own communities or communities like this, in in, uh, uh, in the states and. Um, or community like ours in the cities. And, and if I have this many young people around, I'll ask them, so, and I'll be, it, for example, in my neighborhood, we've had, this year, we've had more, we have record numbers of, of kids from uh, high school uh, or secondary school going off to college, which is amazing. That hasn't happened in our neighborhood in decades. And so I'll ask them, it's like, so how many of you are going to college? Almost all the hands go up and they're really proud. And then I ask them, so how many of you, uh, when, you know, let's just, you get, you go off, you get your great college education, you come back, and you get a, uh, a someone offers you a lot of money with your job. How many of you are going to come back to this neighborhood? All the hands go down. And that is a problem because we're not creating the kind of community that those people who have every right to sort of see their own community as a beautiful place, and who I think it would be great if other folks saw them as the beautiful resources that they are. That would be great. We should be able to do that. So, but interestingly enough, people from when when in low status communities and poor communities, just because the people that were born and raised in them don't see value in them, doesn't mean that people from outside don't. So. When we are, when, when, so when neighborhoods start to change, and in the States they call them, it, it's called gentrification, where you have, where there's a poor neighborhood, and then investors come in and they, you know, um, uh, buy up the, 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 the housing stock from the poor people that are there, and then they, 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 they buy it for cheap, and then they move richer people in. So poor people are displaced. Um, and then there's, so what, what we call the, and then that's that, and then the neighborhood gets better. So again, people from outside see value in those, in those communities, and we sell early and cheap. So we see these kinds of, um, of uh, flyers uh, and uh, letters in, for people to sell their house fast, and that's what happens. But just because you know, the neighborhoods change doesn't mean that people in our communities don't have to be a part of it. But right now, there's only two ways to develop real estate in poor neighborhoods. There's just the way it's gentrified, sort of typically, or the way that, uh, or poverty level economic maintenance, which is the kind of stuff that I showed you before. And so what we tried to do is think about something different. Because we knew that there had to be a third way, and it is that talent retention way, like actually build the kind of community for the people that are in our own neighborhoods to feel as though they don't have to move out of their own neighborhood to live in a better one. How do we create the neighborhood of the, the neighborhood that people want to live in without leaving? And that was our job. So these folks, so we had this idea of doing this, this talent retention strategy. And we actually created, we did hundreds and hundreds of surveys um, and focus groups. And then there was a, a core group of people that just we were constantly getting feedback from. And we call them the Hunts Point Advisory Group. Um, and these were some of the folks that were there. And when it came, the, so at these, this was the list of the type of things that people wanted to see happening in, in their own communities. They wanted places for year-round social gathering. 
Um, they wanted a high quality and beautiful built environment and natural environment, of, of course, because those things were often missing from low status communities. They wanted their kids to, uh, to have like the kind of, of jobs, like real careers in their own communities um, to show that there was real, that we were looking at what was the economic drivers of a region and that we were responding to it by creating that kind of economic well-being in our neighborhoods. They didn't want, they, they also saw that their kids and some of these, there were young people in the advisory board as well, who were like, we don't want to leave the neighborhood. If they, they wanted to reduce brain drain. Um, brain drain, people like to think that brain drain only happens in the, in, uh, the developing world. No, it happens in highly industrialized cities, actually often. Um, in places like that, you know, but when people are taught that they need to leave their communities in order to live a good life. And what they didn't want, they didn't want the stigma of being known in, as a poor community only. And in, in the States, the easiest way to be known as a poor community is like, look at the number of, of quote unquote community centers that we have. And uh, there are the places, you know, there's this arts and crafts for the kids, you know, there might be a cooking class for adults, but basically, you, I've never heard of anyone from a poor neighborhood leaving, you know, once they did well for themselves, to go, some, to, go to another community that had more community centers. Now, they go to places that have great bars and restaurants and, um, you know, libraries and bookstores and cool things like that versus community centers. And because they want to feel good about themselves, they got tired of the stigma of just being in a really poor neighborhood. Um, so some of the things that we did, and we were able to invest um, our own money in some of those, those, that list of things that people wanted to see happening. And so things like cafes and, and restaurants really did kind of like push you know, the top of the list, they wanted those social places. So we actually built this little coffee shop. And it's a tiny little coffee shop. It's probably no bigger than this, this stage up here. Um, but it was the first specialty coffee shop, and we do serve our coffee with ristretto, so it's like anybody here would actually love to have a cup of, of real espresso, um, you know, hand uh, pulled by one of our expertly trained baristas. Um, so it's not like you press a button. It's not typical American coffee. It's really fantastic. So we love you for that. Um, and, and it really is the only specialty coffee shop like that in, in our community. And so we did that because we people were like, we want to see more things like that. And so we partnered with this fabulous coffee um, company in, in New York City that taught us everything that we could possibly know about how to um, create a great shot of espresso and run a real coffee shop. But then we transferred the ownership uh, to, uh, to uh, just all local owners <coughs> back in January of this year. And it's become this incredibly beautiful place that um, the community has just all really uh, taken on. And it is one of the only locally owned businesses run by two women of color uh, from the South Bronx. And we renamed it the Boogie Down Grind, because for those of you who know hip hop at all, the South Bronx, the birthplace of hip hop, is also known as the Boogie Down. So now you know. And uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, we also, again, the job creation piece, the business development piece, then we hear often technology, we know, runs everything at this point. Doesn't matter if you're a tech business or not, technology is in involved in it. So, but in the, in the States, people like to talk about the digital divide in poor neighborhoods, that if people only had access to the internet, then they'd be able to participate. It's a little more complicated than that. Um, because the digital divide is not about access because quite frankly, um, pretty much everybody in the States has access to technology, usually through smartphones, but we have it. So, but what's interesting about this is this is the real digital divide. Are you simply a consumer of technology or can you produce it as well? Are you building it? Are you um, working in it? Or are you just buying it? That's the difference, and that is a divide. And in the States, the, 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 especially young people, I swear, I think they're born knowing how to use a, a touch screen now. It's very crazy. But um, we, and, and I think people, communities of color, incredibly, very savvy, digital, digitally native, they call them. And, uh, and we, they do, they grow up just understanding technology in ways that you know, my generation certainly doesn't. But if you look at 
technology, the way that the American uh, diversity is going, which by about the year 2040, America will no longer be uh, majority white. However, if you look at tech sector diversity, it is very white and very male. Uh, so it's not at all keeping in pace with American diversity. And that's a problem, especially because I do believe that uh, diversity drives and supports innovation. And Lord knows we're going to need a lot more innovation going forward. So our approach to this was creating a model that, um, that helped low status communities actually participate in the tech economy. And so we tend to figure that out. We called it Startup Box. And the first one that we did is in uh, the South Bronx. Uh, so Startup Box South Bronx. And uh, these were, this was our talent base. Um, we, there were folks that were dropped, that had, they were dropped out of high school or secondary school. Um, so we assumed that most of the people would be unemployed. Um, or maybe they graduated high school but didn't really have much work experience. But we were really surprised, but we realized it made sense considering the lack of technology, the, the lack of tech force diversity, um, that many of the people that came to us were actually people that had degrees. They had bachelors of, of arts or sciences in computer science or engineering. And we, we, we were surprised because we assumed they'd be working, but then we realized, oh, there is a bias um, for hiring uh, people of color in technology in America. So we had to come up with a way to help make that, how to kind of trip a, more of a market-based way to get people involved because we knew we couldn't just teach kids to code. Um, it was gonna, that was gonna take a long time. We were more worried about how do we provide uh, an entry-level way to get people involved in the tech economy. And, uh, and so that there would be opportunities for them to build their career as they worked. And we discovered a very interesting thing. There was a lot of folks within a sector of the, of the tech sector that were not happy with the kind of, of options for offshoring some of their work. It's a part, and it was a part of the, the technology development pipeline called software uh, testing or quality assurance. And even though that used to be done in the states, like within the same departments, much of that work is now offshore. And so um, quality assurance, essentially it's, 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 it's testing your software. And so it's like if you were a writer and you have an editor, you, that editor's job is to make sure that the piece that you produce is, is, is hitting its target audience. It's the same way with a piece of software. If you write a piece of software, you develop a piece of software, design it, chances are, you're not going to be the, the person, you're not, it's so close to you, you're probably not going to be able to see the bugs in it. And that's why you send it to get it um, tested. And so much of that work, since it's considered sort of low level, is actually um, offshore, India and China. But the, the folks within the tech world who are in entertainment markets, and that's what I, well, I mean by that is like folks with a lot of like heavy user interface, so whether it was games or websites with lots of moving parts or apps where there needed to be some kind of cultural sensitivity. If, you, if it went to um, non-English speakers, you know, time zones away, the people, the developers were not happy with the product that they got back. They were, they were missing a lot of the nuances of, uh, of having someone who really understood their work, um, you know, actually test it. So they weren't happy. And that's when we realized, oh, maybe if we designed a model the, of, of, of American, you know, local um, software testers for this particular part of the, of the technology market, we might be able to actually provide them a service and also provide them cultural insights. So we did this, um, we did a pilot. We actually hired uh, some people from, from the community, and then we gave away the service to Nickelodeon, which is a was large software uh, uh, entertainment company, and Tresenza, a much smaller one. And we showed them that we could do this work. So we asked them, and, and literally did it for free, so that they would know the kind of work we were capable of doing. And once we realized that we actually had, we were able to do this well, uh, that's when we knew that we could actually take this and create a real business about it. Because the nice thing about software development, you know, or excuse me, about this software testing, is that it not only provided a great service for our clients, 
and money for our team, you know, who actually got paid to do this work, but it also provided for our team a career ladder. Like it little, like the work that you can do, and that work provides a really great way for you to learn about project management and other types of, of things that would help you um, in your tech career as well. And this is just to show that um, the testing market is growing, which is great. And this is, this is when we realized we could take this and actually set up a business around it. So we, um, at these two, we I got these two uh, small storefronts on the, on the main commercial avenue. And so now, Startup Box is, uh, is, is on the corner, and the Boogie Down Grind Cafe is, uh, of course, right next door to it, or next door to the hardware store, which is next to it. Um, and so we wanted to set this up um, right on the avenue because we wanted people to see, look into these great big windows, and see black and Latino people doing technology. People might not necessarily know what, uh, what quality assurance is, but they knew when, because part of the, the jobs of the people there, uh, because they'd never seen anything that looked quite like this, and this particular corner, just so you know, was a very, we used to be a pretty dangerous corner. Um, there's actually, on, my, on our gate, there's actually still a little bullet hole in it. Um, but not anymore. Now they've got people that work on technology, you know, in the same place, you know, 20, almost 30 years later at this point. Um, but we would host uh, gaming tournaments, like people would literally uh, do, uh, do gaming tournaments uh, competitively, um, just as a way we would do that, just to get people in the door so that we could show them that they, there was actually work to do, that there was jobs that they could apply for. And it also created a really fun way for community to get to know us as well, which was wonderful. Um, it also created a, a great way for different parts of our community to actually get together. Um, so I don't know if you've heard, but um, America has a really pretty bad community and uh, uh, police relations, especially amongst uh, communities of color. And, but what we realized was that and when we would host events, that the police officers would come by and sort of look in, and at first people would think, oh, you know, this is this is hard, um, you know, we don't want them around. But then we realized they just wanted to play the games. And right after one very particular um, uh, a bad trial that of a of a cop that killed, um, you know, a, a person in, in the community in a Staten Island in New York City called Eric Garner, um, the trial he was he was released. And it was bad. It was really there's a lot of tension in the actually around the country. But what we did, we worked with our local police department and actually hosted a um, uh, a gaming tournament. Uh, they played Call of Duty. I don't know if any of you are gamers, but they they do <coughs> shoot each other virtually. Um, but it was the first time um, cops and community in our community actually got together. And I'm really proud to say that after that, there were our precinct, um, our police precinct area, was the only one in the South Bronx that did not show an increase in negative community and police relations, which I'm very, very proud of and, and happy because obviously no one got hurt. Um, and also, we're planning on launching startup box um, around the country. That's our goal. Uh, so another thing that people also wanted to see were different places to actually do dinner uh, because there aren't any nice sit-down restaurants where a family can actually be a family. Um, so this old rail station, which was designed by a very famous American architect named Cass Gilbert, um, it used to be an old rail station, then it turned into just like a little uh, strip mall after railroads were considered not that important in the States. Um, I acquired it back in 2011, hired a, you know, a group of kids from the neighborhood to actually just do a little mural on it. And then later on, we, we were now able, the people said that they wanted a nice, quality, family-friendly third space, and, um, and that that was really important to them. And so just recently, um, we were able to get the financing to develop it into a, sort of a restaurant, like a food hall, food court, um, which is basically a bunch of different small local restaurateurs um, in a common dining area. So we're really excited about that. Uh, this spot is uh, very interesting. This is a former juvenile detention facility. Uh, this was where all of the folks in um, uh, New York, all the juvenile 
offenders were sent. And so at one point, it housed more than 1,000 young kids, all under 17, 18 years old, um, who had committed any kind of crime. But, some, but what it was actually known for was even if they didn't commit a crime and their parents were not able to take care of them, they went there. But what it was really known for was it broke children. It was, we had a very bad juvenile justice system in our country. But when it finally closed down, um, you know, I actually encouraged the, the, the city to think about that site as a catalyst for the kind of mixed use and, and even mixed income um, uh, development that was really that would be important for retaining the kind of talent that we know our communities need. So looking at having mixed income housing so that you, the neighborhood wouldn't be defined as a place only poor people should be in, um, but actually you know housing for different levels of income, um, having uh, the kind of economic development that that would create jobs and new businesses actually located there as well. Beautiful public open space because we know that great open space is was well designed, is a great democratizer in, in our cities as well, and also commercial and retail, because people need places to shop. You need to have a local economic um, uh, way for money to circulate throughout your, your own place. And we realized, interesting enough, after we looked at this model, is that the site that we were looking at was very typical of a lot of, of post-industrial American cities, where there, like the orange part, yeah, orange part is um, the area that looks like that is where the residential area, the blue part is the more industrial <laughs> area, and but in either and then the, the site that we were looking at was right in the middle, kind of like like where it would hinge together. Um, but then if you look around, as you look around in any area, uh, you'll find some assets. Like we were building a greenway, there were parks, uh, we were close to, to public transportation. Um, so we were looking at that kind of site and that's where we wanted to see things happen. Um, but if you look at the site now, um, or as it was before, there was this really, you know, if you look at that site, you realize that it's, it's an area that nothing happens. Because on one side, it was a jail. On the other side, um, it was a, a empty parking lots, uh, some illegal uh, auto repair shops, uh, but mostly what people in the neighborhood knew it was good for was a place for a trucker to go and find a prostitute because it was a completely lonely, isolated place. But imagine if that site you had the kind of, um, uh, uh, development that created a 24-hour city, you know, where there was, uh, you know, uh, markets and, and businesses that, and bars that attracted people to be out, um, that there were businesses that actually operated late at night. That could be, that good uses will drive out bad ones. It's the kind of place that people want to live in. Our goal at doing this was not to show that, you know, we could have one beautiful spot in a, in a community that's otherwise kind of crappy or bad, um, but that we could raise the idea of what passed for development in a poor community. And so we, uh, we put together this incredible team, you know, that was very diverse, um, lots of, of um, you know, minority and women-owned businesses, and we put together this absolutely gorgeous proposal for more than 1,200 units of mixed-income housing, um, you know, that even had um, a local home ownership uh, uh, project, 100 units for very low-income people. Um, there was 200,000 square feet of commercial light manufacturing manufacturing, cultural, retail space, and educational as well. And um, we put all that together uh, and it was going to create about 800 permanent jobs. That's not the construction, permanent jobs associated with that. And um, it was just, just beautifully well received by many, many people within the community. I, they actually helped put it together, the ideas for what it was. And um, unfortunately, uh, our city did not, chose not to uh, do our proposal. They instead went with one very low-income housing project with no jobs associated with it. So it's sort of like business as usual, but that all that to say, uh, you know, we're still working on other projects and we're super excited about putting pushing this model about talent retention out there uh, because I really do believe, this is a quote from, from Dr. Martin Luther King, and we do need to be very impatient 
about you know, creating this, this third way of doing development in poor and low status communities because if we are telling people that we need to measure success by how far we get away from, from our community, if we're actually you know, excluding people from being, staying in their, their homes, actually developing themselves so that as, it, as the community changes, that it changes with them and that they're actually benefiting from much of this as well. That's the kind of changes that we want to see happen in our community, so that we're not just seeing you know, um, the levels of poverty being maintained, but we're creating opportunities for people to become less poor. And by creating new opportunities for folks to understand that they don't have to move out of their own neighborhoods in order to live in better ones, are the ways that we can show that we can create the kind of development that doesn't exclude people but includes them and helps them understand that there is possibility within their own lifetimes and in their own communities for them to be a part of the change that they actually want to create. So thank you very much.